I lived in Montana at the time this happened, near the mountains. I lived in a small cabin with my wife and our two dogs. It was normally very quiet and nothing really happened out there. One night, my wife ended up staying late at work to cover for someone who caught out sick. I was at the cabin alone. It wasn't something that was unusual. I've spent plenty of alone time in that cabin before, and it's never been something that's bothered me at all. I was laying in bed getting ready to go to sleep when the dog started barking. I got up thinking that they must just need to use the bathroom really quick. Both of them were sitting calmly in front of the front door barking. It was kind of like they were waiting for someone to give them treats. I walked over to them to see what they were looking at, and when I touched Penny, my Australian Shepherd Rescue, she bit me. She'd never bitten anyone in her life, and I was honestly shocked. By it right after she seemed to snap out of it, she came over to come knowing that she had just heard me. It was very bizarre that she had just bitten me. My other dog, Roscoe, hadn't moved from the spot the entire time. I didn't want to move him and risk him biting me, too. So I shook some treats, and he left the spot and went to eat them. I looked out the window, and I didn't see anything that would have alerted them like that. It was weird. I brought them into my room and laid down on the bed with them. Eventually, I ended up falling asleep. The next day, I told my wife about what happened, and we kind of assumed that they must have heard something outside, a raccoon, a possum, or anything. Later that night, I just finished cleaning up after dinner, and I went to take the garbage out to the bin. I heard something rattling in the distance. I turned to look at where it was coming from, and it sounded like it was coming from our garage. The garage was detached, and we used it mostly for storage. But when I went out there, the garage door was open for some reason. I walked towards it and tried to peer inside to see if I could see if there was anything in there. I assumed it was a raccoon or something. I heard this strange chattering noise from the garage. I froze in place when I heard it. It didn't sound like anything that I've ever heard before. I stopped walking towards it and just turned back to go inside the house. If it was some rabid raccoon or something, it was probably best just to call an exterminator. I told my wife and we decided that that would be best. I called an exterminator in the morning and they were able to send someone out that day. I had them take a look in the garage and around the house. They didn't see any signs of wildlife. No raccoons, opossums, stray cats, nothing. I definitely thought that was weird. I know I heard something in that garage. It was all starting to feel very strange. I went back inside and my wife was working the night shift again. And I was expecting to be home alone until 3 a.m. I brought the dogs into my room and got ready for bed. I was nearly asleep when I heard the dogs barking again. I opened up my eyes and saw them sitting in front of the window, just like they were a couple days ago. I jumped up and peeked through it to see what it was that they were barking at. I didn't see anything outside. At first there was nothing running around or digging in the trash. But I looked up and then I saw it. In the sky I could see these three red lights circling and dancing around. It was close to the cabin, strangely close. Part of me wanted to go outside and investigate it further, but another part of me wanted to run and hide in the closet. I kept my eyes on the lights, and they disappeared out of nowhere. When they both vanished, both of the dogs stopped barking. I couldn't sleep that night. All I could think about was those lights. I wonder why they were affecting my dogs like that. I told my wife, and she thought it must have been some sort of dream. I was starting to believe it for myself, and I actually felt a little crazy. But after about a week later, the same thing happened. I jumped up as soon as I saw the dogs barking, and this time I decided I would have to go see what it was. I ran to the porch and looked up at the sky. The lights danced and coalesced in the air. It was almost hypnotizing to look at. I wanted to run away when I saw them, but I was frozen in place. I woke up the next morning in bed, but the worst headache I've had in my entire life. I was next to my wife and wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I couldn't remember how I got there. I remember getting out of bed and going to look outside at these lights. Everything else just went dark. I woke up and told my wife what had happened, and she thought it was just a dream I must have had. My wife didn't believe anything I said about what happened, and she couldn't understand why it was so fixated on it. 
I just can't shake the feeling that something happened to me that I can't remember. I feel like I need to find out, but I don't even know where to begin. Back in the late 90s, for a brief period of time, I did a few search and rescue missions that left me disturbed. It's not that I couldn't handle the job or even pass the training. It was the result of two specific search and rescue missions that I'm going to tell you about. The first being a young man who had just turned 21, decided to go out by himself during a blizzard up here in Colorado, when he was strongly advised against it. We can't control people and tell them what not and what to do. We prefer to let people make their own judgment calls. And wherever that leads them to is where it leads them to. Unfortunately for this young man, it led to his death. He was reported missing, I want to say about 48 hours after he had gone. Nobody could find him. The conditions of his travel and disappearance were bittersweet. Having a pro and a con, the good news is the blizzard we had predicted did not hit the area in question. To where we had a search, or where we had a search, or where his body had disappeared to, but the con was is that he still disappeared, and finding his body would prove to be worse than we could imagine. After this young man was reported missing, we weren't quite sure if he was dead yet, which is why we went full on with our search. The search lasted nine whole days when we finally caught trail of him, making it easier since the blizzard didn't hit the area, giving us more mobility and accessibility to areas beyond normal reach. The thing that struck us as very odd at first was that his scent ended on the trail that he said he was going down. Our dogs followed it to a specific point and then stopped, as if the trail just suddenly stopped with it. I'm trying to think back and remember how exactly we found his body which might be a little fuzzy in my memory, so forgive me for that. But the story goes that at the end of the ninth day, we ended up finding him in not one piece. But he says he was found on a ledge about 1,200 feet higher up in elevation than the trail he was on. Virtually impossible for anybody to climb in those winter conditions, not even having the right equipment. We're talking about a 90-degree vertical wall covered in thick ice and other dangerous elements, making it impossible to scale. His body was found at the very top, and here is where it gets gruesome. We found him in pieces in a circular pattern. His chest was by itself. His waist was also by itself. His thighs, legs, and feet, forearms, and arms and hands all severed separately with perfect knife precision. The wounds were not cauterized. They were surgically and precisely cut. However, he was dismembered. It was done by somebody who knows what they were doing. Even the bone and joints were cut at very specific points. In each piece of his dismembered body was placed roughly 50 feet away from the other piece. In one large circle buried beneath about two feet of snow. The other piece we'll never quite figure out, as we never quite figure out, as we never found his skull or head. Every other piece of his body was there, without clothes, by the way. We have no idea what happened to any of his gear or clothing. His dismembered pieces were completely naked and left exposed to the temperatures. What it had appeared to be is his cause of death was somehow unknown. But after he had died, or presumed to have died, he was dismembered somehow. And then taken in pieces and laid in the circular pattern. It's very possible he might have died from hypothermia and threw off his clothes and then froze. But that still doesn't explain the dismemberment or how he managed to climb a 1,200-foot cliff wall. If memory serves me correctly, the autopsy reports proved inconclusive to how in which he died. But personally, I'll never get over the manner in which he died and how he was found. That kind of stuff just sticks with you for a long time. The second search and rescue story that I wanted to tell you about happened with an older man who was 78, in great shape, mind you, very active, very fit for his age, and very mentally well, wasn't suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia at all. He ate very clean, was a very well-known individual in the community he lived in. Many loved him and had nothing but good things to say. Until one day in early July, he went missing, like the 21-year-old from the last story, 
He too went on a solo hike like many outdoor enthusiasts nowadays do. After he had been reported missing for X amount of time, the search was called. This guy we searched even farther higher and lower and found no traces. It's as if he had just vanished. But here for this story is where things take a weird twist. The dogs happened to catch his scent and led us to an area not only completely off the trail, but in an area that didn't make any sense for him to be in. And an area where the brush and forest was incredibly dense and thick, making it near impossible for a 78-year-old man without heavy equipment to work through. Now the dogs didn't get us through the woods. They led us to this area of woods and then stopped and began whining. Wow, now you're ready for the twist. I wasn't here on that search and rescue team for this segment of the story, but many of my close friends who at the time were my colleagues were. And this is the only time that I can ever think of that the search and rescue team was called off indefinitely for this man's case. As sad as that is, the report was that they were all nearly jumped and ambushed by a group of large 10 to 12 feet hairy wild men with spears and rocks some of them throwing longs in the direction of my colleagues, while others began screaming, banging on trees, and making all sorts of ruckus as a warning. You better leave this area now, or you're going to die. Many of the same friends, when they recount this to me, you can see and tell the terror in their voices and faces. Having to relive this memory, unfortunately for this older man, his scent trail led right into this area. Where these things or wild men were, as everybody called them. I wish that when I signed up for this job, somebody could have had the decency to sit me down and explain to me that I was going to encounter things that would defy all rationale and explanation. That they could explain that I'm going to see things that don't make sense, hear things, experience things, hear stories about things that aren't supposed to exist. Now all I can do is share my experiences in hopes to educate those that are willing to listen. The state park I work for is really one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been. It has a nice mix of beaches and trails, and you couldn't ask for a better environment to work in. It's the Emerald State Bay Park in Lake Tahoe. I don't even know if I should say the name. I wonder if that makes people flock to the area. This place already does get really crowded. I've been a park ranger for quite a few years, and this is the busiest place that I've ever worked. This experience I had happened in 2019. I had spent some summers out here with my family when I was a kid. My dad really liked to rent a boat and hang out on the water all day. So I loved this place for a long time. We would kind of alternate between here and Lake Havasu for our summer vacations. I never thought I would end up being employed here, though. During summer holidays, the place can be a mad house. I was on duty on the 4th of July that year, and it was a really crazy day with all those people. After my shift, I decided to go up to Inspiration Point to take in the fireworks show. Lake Tahoe puts on one of the best shows in the country, if you ask me. I got myself some snacks and found myself a good spot to relax. I knew all the little secret areas so I wasn't near any people. The show started off as usual and was fabulous. About halfway into it I was looking off to the west a bit and I saw several orange orbs start to float up toward the sky. I remember thinking something like, those must be some sort of those Chinese lanterns. Then, as I was watching them, I thought maybe they were embers from the fireworks or something. But they were incredibly bright, so that didn't really make sense since the embers would be fading. They floated up and they seemed to form in a kind of a W kind of a WW shape. They started to look like they were remote controlled or something. At first they had looked like bright orange lights. But once they were up high, they looked brighter and whiter and whiter and started moving around. Then they kept going higher and started looking like stars. They obviously weren't embers, but then, soared out of the middle of that W-U shape, there was this craft, or whatever you want to call it. The zoom down lower and flew over my head. It was too fast for my eyes to really catch what shape it was. Like fast as a bullet. 
It was still pretty high up there, but the lights on it were brighter than anything I've ever seen. And right after it passed over, there were like these little twinkles of light all in the sky right over my head. Like right over my head, not over the lake where the show was happening. The twinkles of light started making these incredible light streaks. I was beside myself. It wasn't like any technology that I had seen before. It sounds a little crazy that I had noticed this stuff while that amazing show was going on. Maybe it was because I was used to scanning the sky almost every night. The lights were behaving in this strange fashion. I can't quite explain it, but somehow those twinkles of light suddenly burst into dozens of lights in the sky. All of a sudden they were moving together in mass, like some kind of squadron or something. It made me feel kind of anxious, but for some reason I was also filled with this strange exhilaration. I just sat there in amazement, unable to comprehend what I was seeing, but knowing it wasn't normal. You could see the stars steady behind them as they were moving across. Then the dozens of lights came together and went into a triangle formation, whereas before they were just individually flying forward. Once they formed the triangle, I noticed that they were flying left to right, up and down. It was really surreal to have this amazing fireworks show going on, and there I was completely ignoring it and watching this inexplicable sideshow. It wasn't that high in the sky, but not unnaturally low either. But eventually the triangle seemed to just start ascending higher and higher until I couldn't see the lights anymore. Until I couldn't see the lights anymore. I've never seen anything like what I saw before that night. For the next few months I kept watching the sky, trying to take notice of anything strange. But I never saw anything on that grand of a scale again. I'm sure people must think that what I was seeing was part of the show, but it absolutely was not that. I know there's some military activity not too far from here, so I don't know if it could have been connected to some testing or something like that, but I really don't think so. Anyway, I really appreciate the chance to share this here. I'd like to see something like that again, but now that I'm looking for it, it probably won't happen. At the time of this encounter, I was a park ranger at a state park in Arkansas. The place was just gorgeous. Arkansas is known as the natural state since there's so much scenic beauty there. One of the main attractions are the waterfalls. Arkansas has about 300, and some of the best ones tend to be in more the remote and mountainous areas. Part of my job was to maintain the access points to these falls in order to minimize risk for people coming to visit them. A lot of my days started really early. I would get on the trails first thing in the morning to check to see if there were any hindrances. Things happen like flooded creeks, quick mud, dangerous wildlife, etc. The rainy season runs from October to May. The best time to see the waterfalls is in the rainy season, since a lot of the falls go down to a trickle in the summer. So I was out there a lot in the wet weather. My job isn't for everyone. It involved a lot of isolation and rugged terrain. I was pretty much always wearing my steel-toed wading boots and carrying climbing tools and ropes and stuff like that. I enjoyed the isolation, though I've always been an introvert and never was hesitant to get out there alone. One morning I was headed to a pretty remote area that had been impacted by flooding and long-time water erosion. I needed to assess the damage. It had been closed to the public, and we wanted to make it accessible again. I got up before sunrise and drove out. When I got there, the road went from gravel to dirt, which is common in backwoods Arkansas. Eventually, the road became no longer recognizable because of some of the past mudslides and rock slides. I had to park my truck and head into the blocked area on foot. There was quite a bit of destruction on the old road, and I had to bushwhack my way through a lot of spots. I eventually came up on a creek, so I knew I was on the right path. I never actually been to this waterfall before, and I was relying on jops, so I was glad to see the creek. I had to wade through the flooded creek for a couple of miles or so. I was really surprised when I came across an old abandoned-looking vehicle next to the creek. 
It didn't have any license plates on it. The car was pretty beaten up as I got closer. I saw a lot of scratches on the metal and a smashed window on one side. The window that was shattered had some type of cloth on it and there were dark splotches all over the interior. I didn't really want to know what those were from. Maybe fungus or blood. Next to the car looked like someone had made a campsite of some sort. There were some old cans in what looked like remnants of a campfire. There were large rocks around it resembling seats. I noticed that the rocks had a layer of dirt on top of them, and it formed this topsoil of sorts. That meant that the rocks had not been sat on in a long time. I wasn't even sure how long the road to this place had been closed. As far as I knew, it had never been opened since I'd been hired for that area. It seemed that whatever had happened there had been quite a while ago. But that still doesn't ease your mind when you're in the pretty remote area, all alone. No matter how much you don't mind isolation, I kept going with my bushwhack machete unsheathed and my flare gun at hand. At that point, I was out of the creek and back up on the dirt road. I hadn't gone much further when I was assaulted by this horrendous smell of blood and rotten meat. It was what I imagined a slaughterhouse would smell like. It just came out of nowhere. I started to feel this creepy presence, and I slowed my walking way down and started scanning the landscape. When I looked past the creek, I saw a gigantic animal. It was crouched over this big deer carcass. My first thought that it was a gigantic wolf. But I knew there aren't any wolves in Arkansas, and this thing was bigger than any wolf could be. It looked like a werewolf, honestly. It was bent over the carcass eating. It had very long legs with very little fur on them. There was a huge mane around its neck, and its tail was really puffy. The head was unnaturally large, and the forearms were incredibly muscular. Seriously, if you try to bring up an image of a werewolf, that's the closest I can describe it. By some miracle, it didn't seem to know that I was there. I held my breath and backed away slowly. I felt like I was barely moving. It took a long time before I felt I was far enough away to turn around and make the long track back to my truck. The whole way I was gripped by a fear more intense than I had ever felt. I had these wild thoughts going through my mind. Like was that thing connected to the owner of that car. I didn't even want to imagine what might have happened. I notified the proper authority as about my finding of the car and sighting of the creature. I'm really not sure what measures they took to track it down, but the trail continues to be marked as off-limits to this day. I've told a few people about what I saw, but honestly, what are they supposed to think? None of them has ever come across such a thing. That's why I like to turn to your channel and reassure myself that I'm not alone. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.